स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया In the last lecture, we established inequalities on the higher order derivatives of a holomorphic function defined uh, on a domain omega. They were called the Cauchy uh, estimates of the Cauchy inequalities, and we will be using the Cauchy inequalities to establish now that uh, a non-constant uh, holomorphic function defined on the complex plane it cannot be bounded. Let me write the statement down, and we will discuss further. Liouville's theorem states the following: Let f uh, be uh, be an entire function. It's defined on the entire complex plane and holomorphic everywhere. Which is bounded. Then f is necessarily the uh, a constant function. then f is a constant function let's give a proof of this the proof as i have already noted is going to use cauchy's inequalities and in order to do that let's fix some point z0 in the complex plane and consider okay fix a point z0 the first thing to note is that f is a bounded function and since f is bounded we can get hold of some m positives such that mod f of z is less than or equal to m for all z in the complex plane where x is m positive such that mod f of z is less than or equal to m for all z in c so in particular if uh, uh if you consider gamma uh, subscript r maybe let me use the uh, notation sigma sigma r b sigma r of uh, t b equal to z0 plus r e to the power i t for t in 0 to 2 pi this is the circle of radius r around uh, Z zero, then mod of f of z is less than m. In particular, uh, for all z in the image of sigma r, for all r positive, this is uniformly actually bounded by capital M. Now let's bring in the Cauchy estimates to bound the absolute value of f at the point z zero. by the cauchy estimates f prime of z not is less than or equal to the supremum of f on the circle of radius m which is bounded by capital m anyway so this is less than or equal to capital m into 1 uh, factorial by r to the power 1 which is r so notice that uh, the cauchy inequality told us that f n at z not is Less than or equal to m n factorial into m by r to the power n, where uh, m is the bound of m is a bound of f on the circle of radius r around z naught. I mean n is equal to one is applied here. We have this estimate. Now let's take the limit as r goes to infinity. Taking the limit. Notice that in general, when we have the uh, Cauchy inequality here, one thing to note here is that this m is actually dependent on r. It's actually the bound on the uh, circle of radius r around z naught. So if you change the circle, the the number here will change. But in our case, what is happening is that. Uh, the m is uniformly bounded by some capital m because capital uh, because f is an entire function which is bounded 
So this is a bound which is uniform on every r and hence when you take the limit as r goes to infinity we get f prime of z0 is equal to 0 because f prime of mod f prime of z0 is 0 we have f prime at z0 is equal to 0 and our choice of z0 z0 if you notice was arbitrary this implies that f prime is identically equal to 0 now by the fundamental theorem of calculus we have f is a constant function f is a constant function so bounded entire functions are necessarily constants this is actually in stark contrast to uh, what can be seen in the real analysis setting because if we were to look at uh, the real line and consider functions there we have functions like sin x which is differentiable in fact which is real analytic which is bounded by 1 that cannot happen in the, in the complex setting. The moment we have a, an entire function which is bounded, it is forced to be a constant function. Sin x certainly has an extension to the complex plane and uh, you should sit down and uh, think about it that sin x, sin z rather away from the uh, real axis is not bounded. So, that is that's something which uh, we get out of uh, Lewis theorem. And as an application of uh, Liouville's theorem, let us prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. The classical fundamental theorem of algebra tells us that if you take any non-constant polynomial with coefficients in the, uh, in the uh, complex numbers, then it necessarily splits into linear factors. Let me write it down and let us give a proof of the fundamental theorem of uh, algebra here. This will be a proof through techniques in complex analysis which is which makes it more special fundamental theorem of algebra so let p of z be equal to a0 plus a1z plus all the way up to a n z to the power n be a non constant polynomial that means n is greater than or equal to 1 polynomial such that a n is not equal to 0. Let us think of uh, uh, p to be a polynomial of degree n. Then there exists z1, z2, zn not necessarily distinct. Let me just note that not necessarily distinct. such that p of z is equal to a n times z minus z 1 all the way up to z minus z n. It splits into linear factors. Oh, notice that this is a polynomial, we are non-constant polynomial with coefficients in the complex numbers uh, such that let me just add something here a i belongs to c and a n is not equal to 0. So, this is a polynomial with complex coefficients and the leading term is not 0. Then we have our polynomial splits into linear factors. Let us give a proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. The proof is going to be by induction. Proof is by induction. For n is equal to 0 and n is equal to n is equal to 0 is not being considered. For n is equal to 1, the, the theorem is straightforward. Follows directly because it is almost already in, in the form that we want. It will be something of the type az plus b. You can write it as a times z minus uh, minus of b by a and that will be our, uh, our uh, polynomial in the form that we want. Let us assume that the result has been proved for up to n minus 1. Assume that the result has been established up to n minus 1. Okay. 
Now we will prove that the result is true uh, for n as well by a method of contradiction. Let us assume that uh, let p of z equal to a n z to the power n plus up to a 0 be a polynomial of degree n that means a n is not equal to 0 oh, this is not a to the power n this is a subscript i e a n is not equal to 0 such that p does not have roots in c does not have roots. We will show that this will lead to some kind of a contradiction and uh, uh, hence we will be forced to conclude that P has at least one root in C. Let us see what will happen, what will be the contradiction if P does not have a root in C. The moment P of Z is not equal to 0, i.e. P of Z is not equal to 0 for all Z in C. This implies then 1 by P of Z is a polynomial is actually a holomorphic function it will not necessarily be a polynomial but it will certainly be a holomorphic function uh, it will be in fact an entire function so it will be holomorphic on the entire complex plane because p does not have any roots and by the uh, quotient rule you can straightforward one can check that this is going to be a entire function but then if you notice uh, if uh, p of z, so if you look at absolute value of p of z, p of z is what is p of z? It is something of this type, right? If you look at the absolute value of p of z, that is going to be equal to mod of a n z to the power n plus a n minus 1 z to the power n minus 1 all the way up to a 0. And by uh, triangle inequality, you can write that this is greater than or equal to mod of a n times uh, z to the power n. So, let me write it this way minus absolute value of a n minus 1 z to the power n minus 1 plus all the way up to a 0. And uh, by for r for mod z greater than some capital R which is say greater than 1, we can say that this is greater than or equal to mod z to the power n times mod a n minus mm, 1 by mod z times absolute value of a n minus 1 plus all the way up to a 0 by mod z to the power n minus 1. we can say something like this. Let us now focus on uh, what is written here or the second term. The second term is 1 by mod z into mod of a n minus 1 plus all the way up to mod a 0 by z mod, there is no mod necessary inside. Here again z minus 1 this is less than or equal to 1 by mod z times mod of a n minus 1 plus all the way up to mod of a 0 by mod z to the power n minus 1 by the very simple straightforward triangle inequality. And if we are to pick mod z uh, to be greater than r which is greater than 1 as well in particular 1 by mod z will be less than 1 and therefore mod a 0 by mod z to the power n minus 1 would be less than mod a 0. Similarly, for all other terms, we will be able to write down something like this mod a0 and by picking mod z as large as we want for r large enough, this is less than or equal to mod a0 by picking mod z to be uh, greater than r, we have 1 by mod z to be less than 1 by r and by picking r large enough, th this can be arranged to be uh, less than or equal to mod a, mod a n, sorry, a 0 is already there, mod a n. Of course, mod a 0 can also be arranged, but we would like to have it uh, great, less than or equal to mod a n. By rewriting this, this would just tell us that mod a n 
minus 1 by mod z times mod a n minus 1 plus all the way up to a 0 by z to the power n minus 1 this absolute value this is greater than uh, let, let's uh, arrange for it to be less than 0 and therefore this will be greater than 0. Okay, now let us get back to what we were doing. So, this was a slight digression here. This was the digression. We established that for r large enough, this number can be made to be greater than 0. This number rather can be made to be greater than 0. And therefore, so let us say that this is greater than some m prime, which is greater than 0. And therefore, what do we have? We have mod p of z for r large enough mod p of z this is going to be greater than mod z to the power n times m prime which is greater than r to the power n times m prime. So, for again for r large enough given m positive there exists r greater than 0 greater than 1 large enough so that mod p of z this is greater than capital M and this implies that 1 by mod p of z is less than capital M. All this effort was to establish that outside a disk of uh, closed disk of radius capital R 1 by mod p of z is bounded. Okay, what can we say about 1 by p of z in the closed disk of radius r? Notice that since our closed disk of uh, radius capital R is compact and 1 by p of z is in particular continuous and 1 by p of z is continuous, we have 1 by p of z is less than some m1 for all z in d0 r bar. Therefore, therefore, if you pick m2 to be the maximum of uh, m comma m1, we have 1 by mod p of z is or rather the absolute value of 1 by p of z this is less than m2 for all z in c. So, that is what we have established just now, but what did Liouville's theorem tell us? Liouville's theorem told us that bounded entire functions cannot be uh, non-constant and here we have 1 by p of z which is a entire function which is bounded. So, by Liouville by Liouville's theorem 1 by p of z is a constant and that would tell us that p of z is a constant, but that is a contradiction right because p of z is a polynomial of degree n which is greater than or equal to 1, in fact greater than 1 in, in the case we are considering and constant functions have degree 0 which is a contradiction. So, our assumption to begin with was false, hence there exists at least one root let us call it zn in C such that p of zn is equal to 0. Now, p is a polynomial in particular uh, it is a holomorphic function or p is a polynomial hence we can use factorization directly to p or if you want to treat it as a holomorphic function we have also proved that we have a, a factorization for holomorphic functions using that we will be able to write p of z to be equal to q of z times z minus z times z n where q of z will be of this type a n times z to the power n minus 1 plus b n minus 2 times z to the power n minus 2 all the way up to b 0. Notice that a n will be preserved because the leading coefficient of p of z is a n. 
So, the a n will be preserved here and by induction by the induction hypothesis q of z is going to be equal to a n times z minus z 1 all the way up to z minus z n minus 1 because it has degree n minus 1 and for all polynomials of degree n minus 1 by induction hypothesis we have assumed that we already have an expression of this type. This implies that p of z is equal to a n times z minus z 1 into z minus z 2 up to z minus z n and that is precisely what we had set out to prove. We will now prove a form of converse uh, to the Cauchy's theorem. Cauchy's theorem stated that if you have a function which is uh, holomorphic on a given domain omega and if you have a closed path which is null homotopic then the integral of f over uh, the closed curve is 0. A form of converse would be to demand that if the integral of uh, f over a closed curve is 0 then our function is holomorphic. So, that is going to be uh, the type of statement we will be proving. This theorem is called Morera's theorem. This is going to be a direct application of the Cauchy integral formula which is again a consequence of the Cauchy's theorem. Let omega be an open subset of C and f from omega to C be a continuous function. We are not demanding uh, the regularity to be anything more than continuity. So, we just start off with a continuous function such that the function f is conservative in the sense that integral of f over gamma integral of f of z dz. So, many times I have been writing just integral of f, but that means integral of f of z dz. This is equal to 0 for all gamma a closed polygonal path in omega. The conclusion is that then f is holomorphic on omega. A moment's thought will tell you that we are not doing much here because if uh, you go back to the second fundamental theorem of calculus with the added assumption of omega being connected, this ensured that we had an antiderivative which was holomorphic. We will certainly be using that, however, a little more work needs to be done. Let us see. Let us focus on, so even though the notion of uh, holomorphicity has a global uh, nature, the definition is local. So, we will focus at some points at 0 and at disk where uh, we, we would like to discuss the holomorphicity. So, let z0 be some point in omega and uh, r greater than 0 be such that dz0 r is maybe the bar is contained in omega. And we will focus our attention entirely on dz0 r. Any closed curve, any closed polygonal path in dz0 r is a closed polygonal path, let us call the path gamma, polygonal path in omega. And hence, integral of f over gamma is equal to 0. But now we are in a good setup. We did not a priori know whether omega was connected or not. However, the disk of radius r around z0 is certainly connected. In fact, it is uh, much more, but we will only use the fact that it is connected to conclude that by the second fundamental theorem of calculus, because our function f is continuous, there exists a holomorphic function, an antiderivative which is holomorphic, capital F on d z 0 r which is holomorphic. 
Till now we have not done anything new. We have just used the second fundamental theorem of calculus. But now is where we are going to use the knowledge which we have just gained. Holomorphic functions because they are complex analytic. You will hence be able to conclude that its derivative is also going to be a holomorphic function. Since f is complex analytic, f prime of z. So, this is going to satisfy f prime of z is equal to small f of z on dz0 r. f prime is a holomorphic function is what we get to conclude on dz0 r. i e small f is holomorphic on dz0 r. Then the choice of z0 is arbitrary, which means that f is holomorphic on omega. So, notice that uh, we started off with just a continuous function. The only assumption on the irregularity of uh, the function f was that f is a continuous function. And then we used the uh, fact that it will have an antiderivative by the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And because the antiderivative is holomorphic, it is complex analytic and hence its derivative, the derivatives will also be uh, holomorphic, the derivative will also be holomorphic rather. Morera's theorem is a standard tool for uh, checking whether a given function is holomorphic or not. Uh, let me give you a direct application of Morera's theorem to conclude that the uniform limit of holomorphic functions for example is going to be holomorphic. Let me just uh, write the statement and see how Morera's theorem is actually uh, coming into the story, uniform limit of holomorphic functions. Let us see what this is. Let omega again be an open subset and f n from omega to c be holomorphic on omega for all n in natural numbers and such that f uh, fn's converge uniformly on compact sets converges uniformly on compact sets to f notice that uh, the notion of uniform convergence of uh, f ends to f on compact sets that is something which can be thought of with respect to the topology on R2 as well it is the same the it is a topological notion that we are dealing with. The conclusion here will be that then f is also holomorphic. Let us give a quick proof of this this is going to follow uh, directly from the Cauchy integral formula. Yet again we have to show that f is holomorphic which is a local property to be checked and therefore we will focus our attention in a small neighborhood of our uh, point in question. So, let z0 be some point in omega and r positive be such that d z0 r bar is contained in omega. We will focus our attention in this open set d z0 r. Since f n converges to f uniformly on compact sets in omega, in particular uh, f n converge to f uniformly on compact sets in d z 0 r. Now, let us take any closed polygonal path in d z 0 r. Let sigma be a closed polygonal path. In dz0 r, in particular, the image of sigma is a compact set, and on the image of sigma, f n converges to f uniformly. Since uh, sigma, let me just uh, abuse notation and say that sigma is compact. What I mean is that the image is compact, f n converges to f uniformly on sigma. 
and hence the limit we can now interchange the limit as n goes to infinity of integral of f n over sigma this is going to be equal to the integral of the limit f n over sigma which is equal to the integral of f over sigma. But then at each stage this is 0 by using the Cauchy's theorem because sigma is a closed polygonal path uh, in a uh, disk of radius r around z0 in particular any closed path here this is a convex set simply connected every uh, closed path is going to be null homotopic and by Cauchy's theorem integral of fn is going to be 0. And this tells us that integral of f over sigma is also equal to 0 for any closed polygonal path in dz0r by Morera's theorem now. Since f is satisfying the condition that it is integral over, oh yes, before I say any of these things, since fn converges to f uniformly on compacts, f is going to be continuous. Since fn converges to f uniformly on compacts in omega, we have f is continuous from our theory which we have developed in a real analysis course f is continuous on omega. So, we already have that uh, hypothesis for free. So, we can certainly now apply Morera's theorem to our function to conclude that f is holomorphic on omega. And that is what we were attempting to prove. So, before we stop let us look at uh, let us summarize rather what are the things that we have concluded about uh, complex valued functions till now on uh, domains in C. If uh, f is a function from say a b into r where a b is some uh, interval in maybe open a b that is better some interval in r then what do we uh, have about the collection of uh, functions that we have. We have a broad collection of functions which are continuous. F could be continuous, then it will be in this big collection, this big set. If we put more regularity assumptions, then there will be a smaller set which will be differentiable functions. So, this let me call it as let me not use C1, so I will just use differentiable. We can actually ensure that for every k there is a function which is k times differentiable and not further. So, I will not write all of them down, then we have a, a collection of smooth functions. There are smooth functions, there are differentiable functions, there are k times differentiable functions which are not k plus 1 times differentiable, there are uh, differentiable functions which are not smooth. So, this a smooth function is certainly differentiable, so this is a sub collection and we further have a sub collection of analytic functions. There are smooth functions which are not analytic. Yeah. So, for example, e to the power minus 1 by x. Now, if you look at functions in uh, an open subset of C, open subset of C and F, uh, B functions on the set omega, we however do not have as many classifications as we have in the real analysis set, real analysis setting. There will certainly be the broad class of continuous functions here. But then the moment we go down to a subclass of complex differentiable functions, complex differentiable on omega. But that is going to be the same as complex analytic functions in fact or rather let me use the word holomorphic I should certainly use this the complex differentiable on omega is just what is captured most times in our course by holomorphic on omega. But this is the same as complex analytic which we have just proved. These three classes are uh, the same in our case in fact so if I had to uh, 
shade it here, this class is actually the same in our uh, complex analysis setting. Of course, there is one more interesting class of functions which can be put down here. This is the set of all those functions f from omega to c such that integral of f over gamma is equal to 0 where gamma is a closed curve. Now, notice that that is actually a special class. If omega for example was something like c minus 0, c minus the origin and if you look at f to be 1 by z then integral of f over gamma is not necessarily equal to 0. So, it is not true that uh, f will always have an antiderivative. Of course, if omega is special, if omega is something like simply connected, then this will also turn out to be uh, 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 the same uh, collection, but that is generally not the case. So, there is an extra class here. Of course, we do have uh, an extra collection of functions which can be put here. Those functions which are uh, real differentiable, but which are not uh, complex differentiable. Those real differentiable functions which do, which do not satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations. Similarly, CK functions for that matter, uh, which do not satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations or smooth functions which do not uh, satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations. That is not something which is to be uh, kept apart in our study. They actually do form an integral part of the study, but nevertheless, for the purpose of uh, categorization of complex differentiable functions, we will focus only on them and this is the diagram capturing that. In the next lecture, we will, uh, we will solve a few problems which will uh, strongly use the various applications and the consequences of uh, Cauchy's theorem that we have discussed in this video.